not to be confused with the other Sarah, Sarah Grimm, who kicked off last week's um, Module 1 of this series. Um, I'm pinch hitting for, for Sarah Grimm uh, this, this afternoon as we get underway today with Module 2. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to get us started here and then turn it right over to the folks from Preservica so that they can get to the, the heart of the matter. But by way of introduction, um, this is again module two of the two-part series on basics of digital preservation, practical digital preservation. We have two speakers again today, Michael Hope and Jack O'Sullivan. Uh, Michael has over 25 years experience helping organizations around the world maximize the benefits of their IT and information management systems. His re recent focus as the Marketing Director for Preservica has been to raise the awareness of the importance of digital preservation, including devising and running education in partnership with leading industry bodies, such as the Archives and Records Association um, and the Information and Records Management Society, both of those are in the UK, and then the American Records Managers Association, ARMA, and of course, COSA here in the United States. And joining him will be Jack O'Sullivan. Jack is the lead technical consultant for Preservica. He resides in Boston. He's been with Preservica since 2011. And he has worked as a developer on a number of digital preservation projects for many of Preservica's major customers, including the UK Parliamentary Archives, the HSBC Corporate Archives, and the National Library of Australia. He's been responsible for leading development on a number of Preservica workflows and features, including the migration of content within container formats, integration to Amazon's Glacier Storage, and integration with Archive Space. He's also worked closely with FamilySearch on a number of projects, including providing support to maintain their 50 terabytes a day ingest rate, and that's a pretty impressive ingest rate. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Michael and Jack. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to, you know, to work with COSA on uh, delivering this training program and thank you everybody for joining us today I uh, hope to have another good uh, good session today and in particular thank you everybody for your you know, positive feedback and your comments uh, from uh, from module one uh, we hope to co you know, continue that uh, in this session today and uh, as we did last time uh, there'll be an evaluation uh, as you exit WebEx and we, we'd love to get your feedback on uh, how we're doing, what we could do more of, um, do less of, etc. And everybody who fills in evaluation and provides their email will get a copy of the copy of the slides uh, as well. Uh, we're going to have several breaks for questions as we go through, and probably have a little, uh, like a mini break, uh, about about halfway through as well, so you can get a get a leg stretch uh, and uh, you know, clear your minds for the for the second half. So last week we looked at the uh, the fundamentals of digital preservation, uh, looking at uh, ma many of the main <coughs> acronyms and technologies, and uh, you know, sh showing how that can be applied to the to the practical world. Uh, this time we're going to move on. Uh, we, we'll touch on some of that uh, this time, looking at uh, preservation and file format migration in particular. But the main focus is going to be um, on how digital preservation fits into the information and the information governance uh, life cycle. Uh, so it's not an island to itself. It has to uh, participate uh, with other systems and use state, state archives and government agencies need to, uh, to also exchange information uh, between, between yourselves. So we'll be looking at um, how, how digital preservation plays uh, in that whole world. Uh, as well as looking at how to use controlled access to provide greater transparency to information, which is also key to um, you know having a sustainable archive. If you've got lots of people using and uh, looking at your your information rather than it being in a dark archive, and that can uh, certainly help with sustainable funding as you go forward. So just. Uh, just to remind ourselves why we're all here, um, digital content and records are, are fragile uh, and we need ways to protect them, you know, protect them from loss and, uh, and media degradation and bit loss. Uh, and <clears throat> not just the bits and bytes, we also need to have a way to proactively manage all those different file formats uh, to move them on to newer formats as, as file formats become obsolete and we need to organize them and have metadata so we can actually you know, find the information 
uh, in the long term. Uh, as we, as I mentioned last time, the consensus is building that um, the, you know, the, the challenge is compounded, if you like, uh, by long-term records uh, now <coughs> potentially coming under under threat. Uh, the consensus is anything over 10 years old or needs to be retained for longer than 10 years, and we all have records which we might not need to keep forever, but um, we. Uh, we have in our organization records we might need to keep for 10, 20, 30, uh, and in some cases, you know, 50 or 75 years. Uh, those are also uh, at risk, so it, it brings an extra challenge uh, to the job um, of, of preserving, uh, preserving records. So here, here's just a few of examples of, of some of those records, uh, health records, as I said, Every organization, uh, whether it's the, a state archive or a corporation um, or even a lot of the um, cultural and, and memory institutions you work with all have your long-term uh, records which they need to keep for compliance reasons or regulatory reasons or for you know, a legal, legal defense. Um, so this, this adds into the mix and this is something we'd be focusing on um, as we go through this session. Uh, looking at what we need to do in particular to handle long-term records and applying uh, records management type actions and classification to those records to make sure that we can um, appraise them and, and also maybe just delete them uh, in the future if that's what the, you know, the policy for that record uh, requires. So Jack will look at the, that in, in a lot more detail. Uh, it also means we need to be able to these records from somewhere. Um, so typically, um, content these days uh, is held in, in some sort of enterprise content management or records management system, whether that's within uh, your organization or it could be within agencies or other departments that you're, you're dealing with. And um, this provides uh, a bit level protection and allows content collaboration and is typically focused on short-term records, um, but we need to find, need to have ways and mechanisms uh, to, as we've, seen, as we've seen, protect those records over the, over the long term um, and get them into the, you know, into the environment of a, of a digital preservation system so we can apply um, in file, file format migration to make sure that we can actually find this information that's usable and also uh, trustworthy uh, when we need it uh, in, in the future. So that's really how digital preservation sits within the information governance or the information life cycle focused on long-term and permanent records. And Jack will explore the links between um, how we can link to content management uh, systems looking after short-term retention needs, uh, or it could be email systems um, that you might want to to link to if you want to, you want to be mandated to preserve emails and attachments uh, over the long over the long term as well. And finally, as I said, uh, digital preservation doesn't sit in isolation on its own. Um, it needs to communicate with other systems. We've already looked at or uh, mentioned you know, content management systems like SharePoint, um, email systems like Outlook and Gmail, <coughs> but also um, you might have cataloging systems which you're connecting to, Axial archive space, you might want to harvest websites, uh, you might want to ingest content from systems like DSpace or ContentDM, uh, or you might want to connect with your other content management uh, platforms. Uh, we'll, we'll look at ways of, uh, of doing that and how digital preservation can fit within this whole landscape. And re really the, the focus is to make it easy and automated uh, for you as archivists and, and records managers to be able to get that content to, to the safety, you know, that long-term and permanent content to the safety of a digital preservation system where you can look after it and ensure that it's you know, findable and usable in the long term. So that, that just sets a little bit of a, a scene uh, for, for this module two. Um, 
So I'll now hand over to, uh, to Jack, who will take you through um, the first session. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, so I'm Jack O'Sullivan, as I've already been introduced. I'll skip straight through this. Um, so I just wanted to briefly recap what we looked at in module one um, last week. So we were looking at the, the sort of fundamentals of <clears throat> why we need digital preservation and what is actually involved in that. So understanding the, the metadata that we need, the digital specific um, metadata such as fixity and the, the technical characterization that we are going to need. And so today we're looking at, we're going to start by looking at sort of long-term preservation planning and actual actions on, on performing some of those plans. And then we'll have a short break before coming back to look at how we control um, access to our digital content. And then try and sort of draw everything together in a, a an example um, ingest preservation with uh, complex formats. So uh, we'll be looking specifically at um, email preservation. So in terms of what's important, again, um, hopefully we covered a lot of the sort of questions of authenticity and provenance as part of the first module last week. Um, and this week, it's looking more at those questions of long-term preservation how that fits into uh, questions of retention and disposition, um, and then access security and privacy um, to safeguard your content. Um, once more, we'll be looking at some real world practical examples using Preservica, um, and again, other digital preservation systems uh, do exist and you can um, use those as well. So we're going to look at um, how we plan and act to mitigate digital preservation issues as the um, as our initial topic today. So the I mean the first question we have to ask ourselves is where is our data currently? Um, do we have a plan for how we're going to deal with content that is perhaps not already under our control? And so Michael has already talked about the idea that digital information doesn't exist in a nice siloed repository. Um, it exists currently and is managed currently in many different systems across an organization. Um, so many organizations will run multiple of these systems in parallel depending on the, the nature of the, the records in question. And lots of these systems will have some concept of archiving material that is within them. So you can think of archiving your emails, putting them into specific folders, that kind of thing. Um, it's not always necessarily uh, what we have in mind when we think of long-term digital preservation based archives. And systems such as these um, are frequently put into end of life or legacy mode as the, the software moves on, the systems move on. Um, the next version comes along. And so one of the first risks to successful long-term preservation that we might have to consider is, does my digital content exist in a long-term preservation capable repository? Um, and as an extension to that, if it doesn't exist in one of those, does it exist only in um, a legacy system? Is it something that is only being kept around because of the content that's in it rather than because it's being used um, on an active basis. And if that's the case, then we should really be thinking about moving that content away into, into a more uh, suitable long-term preservation repository um, that not only allows us to manage that information better, but it allows us to start turning off these legacy systems that are potentially having um, a cost on, on us to keep them operational. So I want to, um, throughout this session, I'm going to sort of follow the same piece of content as I migrate it out of a 
um, existing content management system follow its path um, through uh, long-term preservation. So I'm going to start with content that is in um, an existing repository. So um, in this case, we're going to look at specifically at um, a SharePoint repository. So hopefully now you're all seeing um, my SharePoint site. So this is um, an installation of SharePoint. Um, I've got some document libraries with various different types of project files and um, other long-term information that I'm managing. I'm specifically interested in this uh, PDP workshop library. Um, and if I have a look at the content that I've got here, I've got various types of Office document that might be typical to um, legacy projects. So I've got some more up-to-date Microsoft Word documents. I've got some open office documents in here. Um, but I've also got some WordPerfect documents, which SharePoint doesn't really seem to know anything about. It's just got this sort of blank icon. And so I need to ensure that I'm getting all of this um, information out of this potentially legacy system, but certainly a system that doesn't know enough about my content to make sure that it's um, accessible in the long term. So there are a couple of ways that I can go about doing this. I can run um, manual sort of backup export routines, and this will allow me to specify exactly what collection it is that I'm trying to um, create a back of, backup of or an export of. It will allow me to save that file out as a um, SharePoint uses CMP as its sort of packaging format. So I can do that. But in a, in a more ideal world, I would build my digital preservation into the, um, the long-term planning that my existing content management system allows me to specify. So within my um, library settings for that particular uh, library, I can start editing individual policies. I can set um, retention uh, policies. So these might give me um, options of what I want to do with content once it's reached a certain age. So this might be based on the uh, creation date of the record within um, the content management system. It might be in relation to when I actually, within that system, declare that this is a record. And so I might have a policy that says that I want to perform some action at some period of time after that event. And so in the ideal world, that action will be, I'm just going to archive that in my long-term digital preservation system. I can set this up and everything sort of happens um, behind the scene. Um, but this might just be that I need to set various sort of retention, deletion, um, appraisal actions to be, um, to be performed. So in either case, what I'm going to end up with is content that's been exported from my um, content management system. And that will generally come in some packaged output. So it might just be the collection of files in a zip file. There might be some structural metadata that records the sort of record layout within that system. So I want to be sure that I can um, maintain that. So um, I'll need to be thinking about my digital preservation system having the capability to understand the various types of export that I'm going to get from my from my legacy systems. So having exported content from a legacy system, I need to think about how that's going to be ingested and what my next set of risks that I'm going to be concerned with are. So the first thing we can start thinking about is uh, this idea of uh, what we call passive pres preservation. So this is really ensuring that we have secure storage of all of our digital objects. So this requires security and access control on the um, files. It requires 
some level of file integrity to be being performed and um, storage management systems that can actually perform this sort of file integrity checking that can alert you to any problems with um, essentially sort of degrading disks or tapes, individual tapes in the library that might have a, a particular issue. It's about making sure that we are planning for um, media migration, so being able to move between different hardware systems, being able to move between different types of disk storage, making that selection on the basis of what is going to provide um, good long-term durability of our digital files. And crucially, it involves having disaster recovery plans in place and making sure that these these plans are not only in place, but that we actually test them. So we need to make sure that we have good backups and that we're able to restore from those backups. And this, having good passive preservation strategies, is going to hopefully ensure that we always have um, a copy of those original files of that original content that we're able, always able to retrieve um, a copy that is exactly the same as the one that we were handed initially. As we discussed in the first module, being able to retrieve that original file doesn't necessarily guarantee that we can actually access the information that's encoded in that file uh, in the intervening period that the file format that's being used may have fallen out of use, making it difficult to open. And so just before I move on to considering how we deal with that problem, um, I'd like to point you in the direction of the COSA Resource Center, um, which has um, lots of good resources around strategies for developing um, storage management plans, the, the sort of passive preservation level plans. So even with our content out of a legacy system, it's under good uh, passive preservation. We've got uh, good storage management in place. There's still the risk of format endangerment. So file formats falling out of use, making them difficult to open. And we, we often think of the idea of file formats becoming obsolete. So they really become obsolete when you're actually no longer able to retrieve that, the information that's encoded. And that might be a true global obsolescence. Um, if the software, if this was a particular proprietary uh, file format and the software that created it and can open it just doesn't exist anymore. So if we think back to the Andy Warhol story from the first week, um, the, the software that was used to generate those file formats just didn't exist anywhere in the world. And that's often how people think of format obsolescence. And following on from that, there's a sort of school of thought that suggests that really very few file formats ever reach that point where they become truly obsolete and um, somebody somewhere is still running that software or has a virtual machine that's still running that software or we're able to reverse engineer the file format and retrieve that information but in practice the cost of these kind of approaches I, the cost of conducting the search for that one person in the world who's able to open those files or funding the research project that's required to reverse engineer that file format is, is likely to be prohibitive um, and it's not a strategy that we really want to rely on. And we might have more um, localized problems. So it might just be that the format is in danger of becoming obsolete. So the creating software has been upgraded or discontinued and um, it makes it a higher risk that people are not going to be able to open this file, not just that nobody in the world can open it, but that your designated community can't open it. And that might be a, a truly local obsolescence. So if you think of something like um, applications that we run like Photoshop, 
um, if your organization has decided that it's surrendering all of its Photoshop licenses, then any file formats that re relied on that software to open them are now no longer openable within the institution. It's not that the format has become truly globally obsolete, but if you can't open them, then we're at the at the same sort of place in our in our thinking and our in our risk determination. And a number of factors will go into determining whether you think that a format is obsolete or in danger of becoming obsolete. So proprietary formats are generally going to be more at risk than um, open formats. Niche formats for you know, very small sets of applications are going to be more at risk than formats that are commonly used by a large number of people or a large number of applications. But you also have to consider what your users, what your designated community are going to be likely to be able to do with the files once you've given them. I mean, if they all have Photoshop licenses, then maybe it doesn't matter so much that your institution doesn't anymore. Um, if they all are going to have access to geospatial software, then again, it doesn't necessarily matter that within your library or your archive, you can't necessarily open every single file as long as the person you're giving it to can. But the other thing to think about is whether your designated community are going to hit this kind of error that we see on screen. So you've given them a file, they've tried to open it, and Windows doesn't really know what to do with this. So it knows it might be some WordPerfect file, but you have to go to the open internet to try and find out a little bit more about that. So you might get to this page, which tells you a little bit more about the, the file association. So you know, somebody somewhere knows that this was a, a WordPerfect document. Is your user community going to be able to follow this information, be able to make a, a reasoned decision about which of these software packages they would want to install to be able to run this, um, to open this software, uh, open this file? Are they actually going to have the freedom to install software on their devices, a lockdown laptop that they don't have administrator privileges on? And in these cases, this is where we're going to need active preservation strategies. So this is planning where we're concerned with the underlying preservation of the, the information. And we can start thinking of um, risks, we can start creating institutional risk registers to decide what content, what formats we might think of as being endangered. Um, so the, again, the first question might be, is the information in a legacy system? Um, once we've got it out of a legacy system, can we identify these files? Are we able to validate these files? Do we have rendering software, are we able to open these files? If that software exists, is it widespread in our designated community? And then we can start thinking of the more sort of abstract ideas of, well, is this a binary format or is it something that you could potentially open in a text editor and make some sense of? Is it a proprietary format or is it is the, um, the documentation for this open? And is there documentation for this file format? Once we've decided that something might be at risk, we need to identify some way of dealing with that. So that might be identifying alternative formats, um, in which case we have to start thinking about whether we have the software that's able to generate content in those formats. But we might be able to identify other rendering tools that we are still able to run. We might be able to get historic software that will still run on virtual machines, and that lends itself to um, emulation strategies. So emulation is a preservation strategy that allows you to open files and uh, to run software in a, a simulation of the original working environment that they would have been um, operated in. And it's a particularly useful strategy if what you need to guarantee is that the behavior of your digital information is retained. So software, computer games, these are 
regularly the subject of emulation efforts because what's really important is the behavior of that game um, and not just the the underlying file formats. With more traditional records, things like documents and spreadsheets, being able to see the original behavior might be interesting to you from a historical perspective, understanding how people um, might have interacted with and understood these records. But often what we're concerned with is the information that's presented by that document. And so we might not need emulation in those cases. The other th thing to consider with emulation is that it's, it's a very complex strategy. So the original behaviors under certain under particular conditions of both the hardware and the operating system and the software, they all need to be known, they all need to be replicated. So you need to keep track now, not only of the digital information that you have, but the original um, environment that it was created in or that it can be um, continue to be operated in. And because you're typically running historic software, um, you can also potentially run into licensing issues. So the, the operating systems that you need might be proprietary operating systems that still technically require a license to install and run. Um, and numerous efforts in um, emulation have floundered for legal rather than technical reasons. It's not that we were unable to create the emulation software, it's that we didn't have the correct legal framework to actually allow that to be um, something that we could bring to a mass market. So if we think about um, the idea of identifying alternative um, file formats rather than trying to emulate the original behaviors, then we can think of this in two um, sort of strains of thought. So the idea of normalization and the idea of migration, and they're actually very similar things. So in normalization, you're creating the new copies of your digital content in a different format as part of the ingest into your system. So if you um, have a policy which says you only want to support a small number of well-known, well-documented file formats, um, normalization might be one way of ensuring that even though you're content producers are creating many disparate formats, you can get it into a, a smaller subset of that um, for long-term control. And at the extreme end, it might just be that you are only interested in supporting that small number of formats. So either taking content that was natively created in that format or taking content that can be currently migrated to these formats. And if you don't currently have a means of converting some of that information into one of your supported formats, then you have to decide whether that means you're just going to offer a sort of passive preservation support, making sure that the original file is held intact, or whether you're just not going to accept that information at all. So normalizations and migrations um, the other thing to bear in mind with this is that you're always likely to incur some kind of loss. So this might be a loss of fidelity to the original um, record. So if you think of high resolution image files, um, a migration might lose some of the clarity of resolution, but it might just be that you're losing some of the metadata. So some of the information in the headers of that file might be, um, not replicable in the format that you're converting to. It might just be that you're um, losing some of the original behavior. And we'll come back to the idea of um, loss and mitigation and the factors that go into considering whether you've, um, whether what you've lost is acceptable or not um, slightly later. But for now, I want to show you what normalization looks like as, as part of the um, ingest 
process as part of the digital preservation um, workflow. So for this, I'm going to switch back to looking at my um, desktop. So when I created, when we were looking at the um, SharePoint files, one of the ways I said that you would be able to get this out is from exporting sort of a backup copy and you get this um, CMP file, which is a, a SharePoint um, package containing those original sets of files. And what I'm going to do is upload these um, into Preservica. So I'm going to select that content using the upload wizard that we saw last week. So if I find my um, correct desktop folder, so this is showing me the packages that Preservica knows something about and is able to deal with. So I can select my um, PDP workshop one. I need to be able to select my destination collection, so where this content is going to go within Preservica. Um, and if I hit next, then that's going to start the process of uploading it. So if we move back into the Preservica system, and I can show you the um, this normalization workflow that I've got set up. So it's designed to um, ingest the this content and perform some normalization of um, various legacy office formats. So this is going to be taking things like the, the word perfect documents that SharePoint didn't really know anything about um, and generating more portable copies of these. And so hopefully this workflow is going to start in just a few moments. What we're going to see is that the ingest starts off as um, the same as the ingest that we saw um, in last week's session. So we're going to run through the same set of um, quality assurance checks, virus checking, integrity checking, checking that our metadata is um, correct, processing the SharePoint package so that the structure is going to be replicated from my SharePoint system into my Preservica system. And it's only after we've ingested that content in its original format that we're going to start concerning ourselves with um, the normalization process. And this will hopefully start. It does look like it's uploaded, so it should hopefully start in a moment. And what we're going to find is that the migration policies that I set up in that workflow, that set of pathways um, that will get performed, we're going to be analyzing our incoming package, looking for file formats that are um, part of that migration policy. So we said migrating away from things like WordPerfect. We're going to analyze the, the package to see if we have any of those files um, and actually perform that format migration as part of the, um, the later stages of the ingest. And then hopefully ingest that new content. Okay, so while this is um, happily refusing to run in the background, um, what I'll do is move on to the uh, next topics that we we're going to cover, which is migration um, more generally. So this is the kind of um, preservation 
planning that we might need to be concerning ourselves with um, after the point of ingest. So after the normalization, this might be something that we would consider maybe at 5, 10, 50 years down the line where those initial normalization processes that we um, had set up maybe didn't catch everything that was coming in. Um, file formats might have changed yet again from then and we want to be able to deal with that existing content. So this is migration of content that is already um, within the repository. And again, much like the normalization process, this is designed to um, guard against format obsolescence and format endangerment. But this is a way of dealing with that that sort of delays the decision about whether transformation is needed until the point that we decide that it definitely is. Um, normalization is more of a um, preemptive uh, strike to try and ensure that we don't take on endangered formats. This is a, a more measured, uh, a later strategy that determines um, that we do actually need to do this. And again, this is always likely to incur some form of loss. And we might have different reasons for wanting to migrate. So we might have um, preservation requirements that say this file you know, it's unsupportable in its current format. We can't open it. We're not sure that anybody else is going to be able to open it. We certainly can't ensure that the um, information is going to be readable in sort of five or ten years' time. But it might be a presentation migration that we're interested in. So in this case, we might be perfectly happy supporting the format as a long-term archiving format. So if you think of things like high-resolution TIFFs, JPEG 2000s, these are um, well understood formats for long-term preservation, but not necessarily the, the most useful format for widespread dissemination. So um, these are both formats that are high bandwidth. The, the file sizes tend to be quite big. If you're making them publicly available using your own infrastructure, then you're going to get hit with people downloading these large files when really all they needed was um, a thumbnail JPEG. And it also might enable us to do things like put watermarks into the images or into the into the record so that people so that there's a chain of um, discovery as to where this information sort of originated from. And these two different um, strategies might also give you different uh, considerations for what you think of as um, an acceptable loss. So as I say, changing file format will almost certainly lead to the loss of some level of fidelity to the original record. So this might just be some of the headers that exist in one format that don't exist in another. It might be a degradation in quality of the image or of the audio recording or the video. Um, and it might just be the, the behavior, as I say. So we want to sort of validate the migration to ensure that what we've lost is something that we can live with, uh, something that we're willing to accept. So on a small scale, we can validate this pretty well. We can open, hopefully, the two documents, the two images, and the two files side by side and run small scale tests. We can read through and make sure that all of the information that we actually required from the original is still present in the um, derivative. But if we're going to be doing this on any sort of scale, then we need bulk validation. We need machine actionable um, validation. And this is the, the kind of um, thing that our um, measurement of technical properties is sort of aimed to um, address. So if we can identify essential characteristics 
that we can measure with a computer, then we can start to compare them with a computer as well and help determine whether those um, form, whether the information has changed um, in some form as part of that migration. So we might have um, some form of acceptable loss of fidelity. So these two images here are representing the same basic information. Um, and one of these was based on a high resolution TIFF file that was getting on for 50 megabytes large. And the other one came from a much lower resolution JPEG, which is only a tenth of that size. And so going from a 50 megabyte file to a five megabyte file, um, clearly we've lost something in that transformation. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is, does it matter? Can we actually tell the difference? So part of what we need to decide is what the actual information content of this image is. So in some sense, it's actually just the, the words on this page. It's, it's a photograph of or a scan of a, um, a text document. So in some sense, as long as we can still read the text, then we haven't lost any of the core information. But even if we take that a bit further and say, you know, slightly more holistically, we're interested in being able to see the sort of the exact layout, the, the fact that there was this ribbon running through the um, original text document what we need to determine is whether the the information that we've lost is making a difference. And if that might depend on use as much as anything. So if we're going to be taking these images and creating giant billboard posters at some point in the future, then the loss of uh, fidelity to the original high resolution TIFF image that we'd get from the JPEG might be an issue because we'll notice that when we blow it up to, to that kind of size. But if we think that we're only ever going to be presenting it in this kind of format where we don't, we're not really able to tell as humans that there's a difference between these two images, then we can accept that as um, sort of acceptable. So that future use might also include worrying about sort of future format shifting. So if you think of um, video files that were recorded onto film, and so we might have had an initial digitization program that uh, created digital stills from those films. And we might have done that at a high enough resolution that it was a good enough quality for DVD or for high definition television. Um, basically for the screens that we had at the time. Future use might suggest that you know something like Blu-ray comes along, ultra high definition television, whatever it might be in the future that um, really magnifies the, the uh, losses that we were originally willing to live with. Um, we might decide that actually we should have digitized um, at a higher resolution, we shouldn't have accepted the loss of information when we were migrating from one format to another. So it's a, it's a difficult decision um, and difficult policy to come to because there's some sense of we can only do the best with what we can do today. So if we can't detect the difference today, then that's probably enough, but we also as long-term custodians of these records have to be um, considering the, the long-term um, implications of the decisions that we make today. Um, so I'm going to go through a demonstration of how migration within um, system works. So I'm going to switch back to my demo mode. Um, I first just want to sort of to show you what the normalization workflow looks like when it um, 
does actually run. So we get the initial series of ingest steps that we saw from last week. So identifying packages, performing the various QA steps, going through storing all of that um, initial content. And then the normalization policy takes care of the, the second half of this workflow, which identifies where we have formats at risk, performs um, some various planning steps to make sure that we have the correct tools installed to, to perform the migration that we want to do, um, actually performing the migration and then storing those migrated files as a new uh, version, a new representation of uh, that information. But what we're going to, and what we end up with um, in the system is a document library that looks very much the same as the, the SharePoint library. Um, and we can see we've got two manifestations of this um, set of files. So if we see the original set of manifestations, we've got the, the Word documents and the open office documents um, and there's my word perfect documents and my normalization process has meant that my word perfect documents got picked up and converted to pdf and so this is a set of files that i'm still comfortable that i can download and open but as i say five years ten years into the future i might start to be might be starting to worry about things like um, microsoft word documents uh, will I still be able to open those? And so I can run active preservation uh, workflows from within the system as well. So I go to my preservation menu and start my workflow. So the first thing I'm going to be um, doing is setting up this plan. So I might want to give it a new plan name. I might just want to give it a description of what I'm actually doing. So this migration pathway role again is sort of questioning why I want to perform this. Am I looking to create new preservation or new presentation copies? Um, for this case I'm going to create new preservation copies um, and I want to do this in production mode so that I get those new files coming in directly. I don't just want to test this. So I can specify um, a number of file formats that I think might be at risk. So in this case, what I'm interested in looking for is those um, Microsoft Word files. So I might be interested in um, the sort of latest Microsoft Word docx format. So I might want to also deal with um, earlier versions of Microsoft Word documents. But also I had an open office document in there, so I probably want that in a uh, in the same format as well. So I can find all of the records within my system that are affected by this idea that some of these formats might become um, at risk. And so I can see a list of all of those um, collections, all of those records. And I could choose to migrate everything here, but I'm actually going to, for the purposes of the time on this demo, I just want to pick that one um, PDP workshop example. And I might want to choose what type of migration I actually want to perform. So do I want PDFs, PDFAs, um, open office documents? Depending on the formats that your content is currently in, you might get different options for the same formats but different tools. So I'm going to migrate all of these to PDF so that I've got everything in that record in um, PDF format. So once I click approve on that, this is ready for me to actually execute this um, migration plan so if I click confirm it will perform this migration it will extract those um, files
files back from their long-term storage. It will be running open office to generate some PDFs for me, and then it will re-ingest that content. And as part of that, it's going to start to measure the um, those uh, technical characteristics of the file so that I can compare those across multiple copies of the same information. And so once that's completed, I get a link to go and see my content back in the um, Explorer interface, and I can see what's happened to my record. Um, so I now have three different manifestations. So I have my original manifestation, which was all of those um, individual documents in their original formats. I have the second manifestation that my normalization was able to provide for me, which was able to migrate the, the WordPerfect files. And then I have my latest, my active preservation manifestation, which has all of those files um, in PDF format. And if I step up to the um, record level, I can have a look at the automatic comparisons that have been made measuring some of those um, technical properties. Um, and what I see from these is that uh, I'm actually able to measure more properties on the PDF than I was on the um, original WordPerfect file. But the number of pages I measured on both of them and that was um, the same. And so I can get a sort of sense of what properties might have changed, what information I might have lost as part of these migrations. And what I'll probably want to do is go back and have a look at these um, manually later uh, to, to determine whether I want this policy to apply to everything in my archive. So that I think covers the, the sort of planning, preservation planning of um, moving content from legacy systems, normalizing file formats and actually performing migrations at a later point. Um, so if there are any questions, we're willing to take them now or else um, let's uh, take a five minute break at this point. Yeah, if you've got any questions, then we can we can take those now um, and just use the Q and A. Um, get your questions in. No questions. No questions. What we do then is take a uh, a short uh, five five minute break, um, so you can stretch your legs, and uh, we'll reconvene again at uh, about uh, well, let's say five past uh, five past the hour. So look forward to speaking to you in a short while. Take care.
Uh, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, it's five past the hour. Hope you've had a nice uh, break. Um, so we'll now uh, re reconvene for session two. Over to you, Jack. Okay, thank you, Michael. So what we're going to be looking at um, in this final session of these uh, workshops is controlling access to digital content. So it's in your your content is in your repository. How do you ensure that only people who are supposed to be accessing it are able to? Um, we'll talk a little about more long-term records management um, type issues, such as uh, classification and defining sort of retention and deletion policies. And then we'll pull all of that together and look at a, um, a use case of um, emails as a sort of complex digital record encompassing some uh, long-term records management aspects as well. So OAIS um, specifies that access is going to be an important part of our digital repository. Um, and it talks in terms of providing access to information packages to satisfy a particular user request. So this means giving somebody all of the content they require, but also all of the metadata that they're going to need to be able to make sense of that content. OAS doesn't require us to um, to provide the original content. It merely needs us to provide the, um, the information. So it might be that one of our later manifestations is the more appropriate um, format in which to create this uh, dissemination package. And so this <coughs> generating um, dissemination packages is a a formal requirement um, and something that you might have to perform as a um, sort of as an archivist, as a collection manager. This is very much the sort of back office access to your content. Um, and so we're going to have a look at how to actually export content um, from Preservica. If I sign back into my Preservica system. So the Explorer interface has been giving us as the collection manager, as the archivist, access to all of the content that we have um, as our sort of working interface to, to that content. Um, but this is much more about identifying um, an individual record um, and creating a copy of that so that we can send it outside of the repository, send it to um, another person, an end user who's requested this. So if we go head back to the um, this PDP workshop example, once I've identified and selected that content, one of the um, one of the things I can do is run an export of that um, particular information. And so I can choose to export the entire package, which will send all three manifestations of this uh, record, um, as well as the metadata required to describe it into a, a package that can be downloaded. Um, or I can choose to export just the original copy or the most active copy. Um, effectively, I can choose what the most appropriate uh, form of this information is, what's going to be the most usable to the, um, the user who is requesting this information. So if I run it choosing just the um, active preservation workflow, then this will start um, a workflow which will export a copy of that information, so it extracts the, the relevant files, 
extracts the relevant metadata and compresses that into a single zip file, um, which will then be made available for download. So this becomes available in this um, download tab. So this will show me a list of all of the um, all of the records that have been exported from my system. Um, and there's my PDP workshop containing just the six files, so just that um, active manifestation. Um, and if I download that, I'm going to be prompted for a reason. So this will enable me to audit access to my repository, which is going to be something that you'll want to bear in mind. You need some kind of record of who's been accessing content, when they were accessing it, um, and preferably wanting to know why they've been accessing that content. So that now becomes part of the audit trail for that piece of content. Um, at some point in the future, I can determine that all of the actions that have been taken on this include exporting it for these various reasons and downloading it for these various reasons. And what the system has produced for me is a zip file, um, which contains um, another zip file containing the actual content. So this is my information package, as I say. It's the content, so the original set of, um, or the, the latest manifestation set of files, so each of those uh, PDFs. And also the the system metadata that describes all of the um, records, all of the collections that are relevant to these records, all of the components that we've been able to identify, all of the events um, that are relevant to these components, and down to the individual file level, so giving details of the, the fixity of these files, the exact file formats, um, the preservation events, so identification of file formats, and down to longer term um, properties as well. So the, the extracted technical properties of each of these files is also forming part of that metadata. So hopefully what we've done is created a an information package that's similar to in structure to the one that was sent to us by the content submit, submitter in the um, in the original case. Um, we've got all of the relevant metadata that will enable this content to be usable for some designated community, um, which is really the key to access in the OAIS reference model. But that's not the only way of providing access to digital information. So digital information allows for widespread dissemination in a way that's really not possible for physical holdings. So the, the export DIP workflow is very much an analog of the way that we have typically provided access to physical holdings. It requires somebody to go and find the information and um, bring that out to present to somebody. Digital information means that exact copies can be created and distributed pretty much at will um, to anyone in the world, really, who's got um, an internet connection. Um, and this can happen almost instantly. And this kind of widespread access, widespread dissemination is great for information that we hold that's in the public domain or that we want to make available to people. But it also means that we need to take great care about handling material that we might have that's restricted or embargoed or under access restrictions such as copyright. And in the physical world, archives and libraries have always had policies for controlling access to their materials. And so we need to be able to um, transfer some of these policies into the digital domain. But we also need to consider the um, the more sort of security-based aspects of what we're protecting. So 
we need to protect all of our um, the hardware and the equipment that we have our digital files on, um, because what we're really interested in is protecting our digital files and the content of those files, um, particularly if they include sensitive information, um, personally identifiable information. And really what we're investing is our, uh, sorry, what we're protecting is our investment in those digital materials and uh, crucially our reputation for being able to handle and look after sensitive information. And we might need to protect content even from ourselves. So we want to make sure that we don't have um, accidental losses of, uh, of content, losses of data. We also need to prevent the, um, or make as difficult as possible, the intentional um, destruction of data. So the idea that you might have a disgruntled employee that causes harm or somebody that abuses their permission to remove or change files that are within the archive. These require um, not only physical security restriction so that you know who has access to the to the actual hardware that your information is stored on who has access to the system but also thinking about access policies from the point of view of making sure that you don't concentrate too much power in the hands of one or two employees we also need to consider the um the case of inappropriate access, so all of this information being available on the public internet means that it's susceptible to people trying to attack that system and gain access to information that they they shouldn't have access to. Um, and so things like viruses, tro Trojan horses um, are things that we need to be on our guard against as well as just um, attempted attacks. So hopefully, the, as part of your ingest processes, you were performing virus checking um, and making sure that you are safeguarding your content from the very outset. But you also need to consider the, um, the overall information security policies that are in place in whatever system you try to um, implement. And again, there's good resources on this on the um, COSA website under the um, SCRP framework, um, giving you more information about security and audits um, and the levels of security that you can um, aspire to and reach. But what I want to really focus on in terms of access control is thinking about security models from the point of view of content that is in some way um, restricted. So any security model in general is going to require us to define uh, three basic principles. So we'll have classes of content and that might be um, different designations, classifications. You might have content that's open and some content that's uh, classified under government um, rules and regulations. You might have some information that is in copyright. You might have materials that have been embargoed by restrictions put on them by the donors. So you'll also need to define the different classes of users of your system and of your um, repository so that might include different designations for the general public, for people who are staff, for patrons and donors. You might have different designations for researchers and people who are actually within the, the physical location of your institution as opposed to those um, gaining remote access. And finally, you need to think about the classes of operation that these people might be able to um, perform. So they might be able to see descriptions of content. They might be able to actually read those descriptions. You might need some people who are able to actually edit and manage the metadata and the descriptions you have um, about some of that content. And so when you 
consider these three, these three things in concert, what you end up with is um, a series of policies where what you're going to define is something along the lines of users of a particular class have permission to perform a particular type of operation um, on or against content of a particular type. <clears throat> and so I want to show you how controlling access works um, within Preservica. So to do this, I'm going to consider the separate context of the um, sort of the archivist, the collection manager, whose point of view we've been um, looking at everything from up till now, um, and then the sort of more general public who might have access to some of the materials um, within our system. So if I switch back to my presentation mode, so what we've been seeing throughout this is, as I say, the very much the archivist, the collection manager's view. And so we have a lot of um, permissions to see and to work with the content that's in the archive. So I've been able to view this content. I've been able to manipulate it to perform file format migrations. But what we also have is a more public facing um, portal to all of this archival content. So uh, a sort of end user access um, where we make our open collections available for browsing, for reading and for, for downloading. And so hopefully you can see that these are um, the same set of collections that we've been looking at through the Explorer interface. And here's my um, PDP workshop collection. So if I and step into this, then what I'm getting is a sort of stripped down view of those records that I was seeing in Explorer. And I can get down to the individual records and down to the individual files um, and be able to see those um, to be able to see those files, see the previews, see the content and potentially to download them. So this is because of the way that my security settings have been configured within um, within Preservica. So I have, if we move back, I can show you the security grid. So I have in this drop down menu my classes of content. So I have content that's defined as being open, content that's defined as being closed, and content that's defined as being confidential. I have. For each of those classes of content, I have um, my users to, or my types of users um, in the column view. So I have different permissions for administrator users as I would have for just ingest users or people who just have access to see the content. And then these are the various permissions that I'm able to define um, on this uh, particular content. What I want to draw your attention to is this anonymous user who is the, um, the class of user that's represented by the end user interface. So that accesses the um, backend repository system as this anonymous user. And what we can see is that for content that we've marked as open, we can read the metadata and we can read the content. We have no permission to change that metadata in any way. Um, but we can read it. So if I consider what the settings say um, regarding closed material, what I can see is that the anonymous user doesn't have any permissions on those. So once a record is marked as closed, we shouldn't be able to see it from the public access system. So if I drop back into my Explorer interface, then I can actually start changing the type of content that I've got here. So if I um, drop into my PDP workshop and decide I want to um, change the permissions associated with this uh, particular record, I can simply set that to be closed. 
And now when I go back into my public access system, because I've got no permission to see that content, um, it doesn't show up in my, in my view of the archive. And so these are the kind of access policies that we need to be thinking about and implementing to make sure that we grant appropriate access to people who need that content, but also forbid people who don't need access or who shouldn't have access to that content from, from having that access. So I want to move on to thinking about the idea of um, how digital preservation fits into the um, overall information life cycle. And so at the beginning of the session, Michael talked about the idea of having maybe records that are not permanent, but uh, needed to be preserved for uh, a long period of time. So maybe for 30 years or 25 years or 100 years. Um, whatever that information is, we need to be able to designate it in some way that we can keep it within our digital repository system, but make sure that when it needs to be deleted or when we want it to be deleted, um, it can be. And we need to really think about how we can automate these processes so that we can reduce our, our, our work burden. But on top of that, we have this idea of um, permanent records that need long-term actions being taken on them. So if we think of something like copyrighted material, there might be um, restricted access for the lifetime of the copyright, but after that we want to make that material publicly available. We might have classified material in our repository that's going to be declassified after some period of time. Um, and potentially if it's remaining classified, it might need to be reviewed um, every 25 years or every 10 years, um, whatever our appraisal policy says um, about reviewing those kinds of records. We might have material that's not really covered by copyright, it's not really classified, but part of the agreement that we made when we accepted that material was to um, honour the donor's request that this not be made public for some period of time. So it might be until they themselves um, are no longer around or um, a particular partner or maybe one of their children who is mentioned in the material. Um, so the one example of this was Mark Twain's diaries, which he donated with a uh, access restriction that said they wouldn't be open to the public until at least 100 years after his death. And the, the nature of these kind of restrictions means that we might have to reappraise these records on a regular basis. Um, and finally, we have this idea of sort of unprocessed material. So you might not have performed your full appraisal and selection processes. But if you think of this in terms of how you would deal with um, physical records with paper, you wouldn't just sort of leave it in the corridor in an unmanaged um, position, you would make sure that it was under climate control, that you had removed any um, potentially um, acidic rubber bands or anything that might deteriorate the um, condition of that physical artifact um, in the long term. And you should really be doing the same for your digital material. So you might want to consider how you can get it into a long-term digital repository before you actually have gone through the full appraisal and um, selection process, which might mean that you need some way of deleting material that you don't actually want to keep once you've been through that um, process. And in both of these situations where we have uh, non-permanent and permanent records, we need a way of identifying these um, materials and to, to automate the, the sort of policies, the actions that we want to perform on them on that sort of periodic cycle. And so what we need is some mechanism for being able to classify content and um, hopefully we can do this based on what we know about that content at the point of ingest. 
So we might be able to tag something as being um, a public contract or being email. We'll then need some means of searching by those classifications. So we need this to be something that gets recorded into our metadata so that it becomes part of that record. And finally, we need to, or we would like to, be able to automate future actions based on um, policy rules. So we might need to be able to delete material that's of a particular classification after a, a certain period of time. So I'm going to just sort of walk through how this might work in practice with um, the example of emails. So I'm going to think in terms of trying to automate some level of appraisal and selection on the basis of what we know um, about the email at the point of ingest. So that's exactly the first question we need to ask ourselves is, well, what do we know about this particular record, about this piece of content? And really we know what the metadata tells us. Um, and so for email, we have pertinent metadata fields. Um, for example, we, we know the sender of that email, we know the recipient, we know the subject of that email, we know the date that it was sent. We know whether other people were CC'd into that email or not. Um, and we might know things like the trace route of the set of servers it came from, which gives us some kind of trust in um, how authentic that email actually is. But we also know some sort of system level metadata. So we know what ingest process um, brought this into the system. We might know who the um, person submitting this email was. And so any of these pieces of metadata might be what we want to hang our cl classification from. And one obvious way to think about how you might start appraising and classifying emails is to think about the distinction between record and non-record emails or business and personal, depending on um, how you consider these. So I imagine that I'm not alone in not having particularly great email um, management discipline, I tend to use my work email account for sending the occasional personal email uh, because it happens to be the most convenient one during the working day. And so if we took in my inbox as a whole, um, trying to determine um, long-term business records, we would probably want some kind of way of automatically getting rid of all the personal emails that don't have any relationship to my business or to the, the business of government if I was um, an elected official or um, appointed um, official. And one way that we might know to at least start doing that is to write some rules on the basis of where that email came from or who the email was sent to. So we might know that I know some particular contact, let's call him John Doe at the moment, who is a personal acquaintance rather than a professional acquaintance. He works in a completely different field and we never use email to communicate about business. Um, so we can then, as part of the ingest, one of the things we can do is start classifying any of the emails that come in where we can identify that the sender was this person or that I am sending an email to this person. And we can classify those emails as being personal. We might want to, at first pass, first pass make these um, files restricted. So we might not necessarily want to delete them immediately. We might want somebody to go in and just you know, double check that everything that's um, marked as personal is actually personal. But we might not want them open to public view while that's happening. So we might choose different security restrictions on the basis of our classification. And once that classified um, document is in the system, then we can start writing policies that enable us to um, actually perform some actions on the basis of that classification. So we might have a policy that runs maybe once a day or once a week um, 
that will search through the system for any emails that have been marked as personal um, and then delete them or potentially flag them for appraisal. And we might think about doing this for um, other types of material. So you can, I've walk, walked through this example specifically relating to email, but we might have enough metadata with an incoming record to know that it's in copyright. So we might be able to tag it as copyrighted material um, and we might be able to use that metadata to determine a policy that says after five years I want to change the security settings or the access restrictions relating to this because it's going to fall out of copyright. And once we have these tools we can also use them for the management of um, non-permanent records. So we've seen the idea that we can use this automated policy to appraise and delete emails on the basis of their classification, we might be doing that on the basis of a retention period. The basic underlying principle is the same, it's being able to write a, a rule or a policy that works on the basis of some classification and is able to perform some action in the system um, because of that. So with the last uh, 20 minutes or so, what I want to start considering is how everything that we've looked at so far in, this, um, in these webinars sort of can be brought into a single use case. And I want to think specifically um, about a complex digital record, so things that don't really have um, a direct analog in the physical world. These are very digital age problems. So I'm going to talk about um, web archiving, but I'm actually going to run through the example um, with email. So we need web archiving. We need preservation of our websites because the World Wide Web is increasingly where we are storing or where we are recording our collective memories. So we've always, as collection managers, as archivists, as librarians, we've always been charged with the preservation of uh, sort of collective memory, um, whether that's things that were carved into stone that we've got to look after, whether that's um, printing words on paper, images, sound recordings, Increasingly, this is happening on the web, and if we are unable to preserve those resources, then we're going to lose some of that sort of collective um, memory, some of that cultural um, heritage. But preserving websites is not um, an easy thing to do. So what makes it hard is, well, there's been 25 years of evolution of the internet, of the World Wide Web. And speaking to people who are archivists and collection managers, 25 years probably doesn't sound like a, a very long time, but in technological terms, it's, I mean, it's practically an eternity. So if you think about 25 years after the invention of the printing press, the basic apparatus, the outputs that were generated haven't really changed in that time. But that same time frame on the internet over the web means that what we see today is almost completely unrecognizable from the markup text that we, Tim Berners-Lee, imagined 25 years ago. And each new generation of technology, each new generation of web pages has introduced hurdles that make preservation that little bit more difficult. So. Even if you think back to the earliest web pages, they introduced this concept of um, links between documents where it's now no longer enough to look after one file or one set of files. We have to make sure that all of those links continue to work to get the full context of that record. Graphical browsers made recording the layout of a page um, increasingly important, images um, and the location of text 
and images on a page became every bit as much a part of that digital record as the text itself. Sites like Amazon have shifted the way we as users interact with web pages, so navigation increasingly being search driven and then and because of that it's dependent on some kind of back end process. So the idea of simple web pages has kind of fallen by the wayside. Lots of web content now is dynamically generated views from data that's stored um, in some back end database. Sites like the BBC and Google are vast record stores that are updating, if not hourly, then by the minute even. So we have to try and keep a handle on you know, exponential increases in the amount of data. We have things like Friends Reunited, um, which led on to uh, innovations like Facebook, where all of the interesting content now is really locked away behind a, a login wall. It's, it's personalized views of that data that are specific to you as an individual. So how do you preserve that um, level of um, user-driven um, behavior? So it's like YouTube um, that are entirely multimedia driven um, and where the content that we're looking to preserve is now dependent on software that's not just the web page, it's not just the browser, it's external files that we need we need to preserve. And increasingly sites like Twitter and Facebook are using back-end web, web applications to continuously update the page. So if you load one of those pages um, in the morning, the news feeds come in and keep updating that page and so it looks different when you go back to it, even if you haven't closed it, it looks different when you go back to it several hours later. So all of these um, complications make web archiving um, a difficult proposition. And web archiving has sort of grown up hand in hand with um, the idea of email preservation and we can draw a lot of parallels between email and the web. So in much the same way as the web has evolved into our primary store of collective memory, email has turned into our primary means of correspondence. Um, we've always been charged with preserving significant records and that's always included correspondence um, between people. These are records of decisions that are being made, of thought processes thought processes that are being um, hashed out. And increasingly that correspondent is entirely in electronic format. And often even where a formal letter is still drafted on you know, specially headed note paper, this is being emailed as an attachment electronically rather than printed and sent through the regular mail. Um, and unless we are taking specific steps to ensure that all of those relevant emails are going to be correctly filed and recorded, um, and especially um, covered by retention and disposition policies, and we're at risk of losing um, all of this valuable content. And again, it's a, it's a complex record in much the same way that um, websites are complex, and what makes email so hard is a number of things. So there's a single internet message format, which is how emails are sent across a network. And that itself is well defined. But once that message gets sent and it needs to be stored somewhere, there's again a whole alphabet soup of file types that exist to encode that message. And they all do it in a slightly different way. So you have things like MSG files, EML files, um, some of these are open, some of them are proprietary. Just being able to cope with all of the different email formats is a challenge in itself. But then you have all of the different systems for reading these um, different file types. So 
and for actually performing the communication of email. So systems like Gmail, like Hotmail, like Outlook, like Lotus Notes, all of these do slightly different things. They read the information in slightly different ways. They give you slightly different views and behavior. Um, so things like categorization and prioritization are not necessarily standard and harmonized across all of these different sy uh, systems. Um, and emails tend not to exist as individual messages. So we understand emails in terms of inboxes and mail folders. We have structure to our email correspondent and that whole structure is often exportable as a single package. Um, but these packages are again, there's several of them, inbox formats from, G, uh, from Gmail, PSTs from Outlook. And all of these are, again, complications that we have to deal with when it comes to preserving email. But they're also complex digital documents, so they allow for complex formatting. They allow for HTML markup and embedding of images into the email and links to um, web pages and documents. And these all form part of the context and potentially the behavior and functionality of emails. And so that's, again, something that we have to consider when we're trying to preserve emails is making sure that we don't lose that formatting because that could be um, an important part of the record. And again, emails don't really exist in isolation as just a message. They often come with um, attached files and quite often the Attachment is really the, the key piece of information that's being transmitted. That's the, the key record that we need to keep hold of. And the, the email itself, the .eml file, the, the message that's being sent is little more than a packing slip that just says I'm attaching these documents. So when it comes to email preservation, we have these, this full range of issues that we have to worry about for, for preservation. We've got multiple file formats, multiple complex package formats, all potentially subject to format endangerment. We have complex formatting and encoding of information that we need to ensure is preserved in the long term. And of course, that's on top of the digital preservation challenge that's posed by the attachments, which are arbitrary files potentially in, in any format. And this is in itself just talking about the, the sort of technical difficulties of dealing with email. From a policy point of view, from a legislative point of view, we have the, as I say, the intermingling of record and non-record items often in the same package, in the same container. And sometimes we don't have hard and fast rules as to what constitutes a record and what doesn't. So there's a whole series of um, policy decisions that need to be made that complicate the idea of um, email preservation. So I want to sort of step through the idea of this complex case of email and show you how um, a digital preservation system can help you to at least start getting these um, issues under control, bringing all of that content into a into a managed system that will enable you to make long-term preservation decisions that will enable that content to continue to be useful. So I don't want to go through the, the whole process of, of doing this as part of this demo, but one of the things you can do in Gmail, and this is the example I'm going to use, is export your data. You can export all of your emails, all of your um, mail folders as a single um, archival package called um, an mbox. And so I've, I've gone through this process through the um, Gmail website, as I say, um, and what you come out with is this mbox file with um, my this is my export of uh, content. 
So I'm going to use my upload wizard once more to to upload this content into Preservica. So I'm going to choose my data. If I don't scroll past the folder too quickly, again, this is a, a package format that I don't really need to do anything else with. I can just send it to my repository. I can choose where it's going to go, so I can put it in my workshop folder. And this is um, a Gmail account that I mostly try to use for, for work, but as I say, don't have great email discipline um, and there are often personal emails that sort of sneak their way in. Um, so what I've done in Preservica is set up a classification policy that has um, a list of email addresses that I know are going to be uh, personal emails. And so it's going to search through um, all of those emails and apply um, those classification policies. Um, and I'm not sure why this is not immediately starting. There we go. So this is going to um, identify that mbox package, hopefully. Okay, apologies, I seem to be having some problems getting this data up to the system um, today. So what I'll show you is the result of running this ingest um, across email inboxes. So what I've sent up in, um, in this particular case is my inbox, and so this is an export from Gmail in much the same way. So I sent up a single file, and as part of the processing, we're able to unpack um, that there is structure within that package, so the inbox, um, which contains uh, a series of emails. I have a separate record for um, each individual email message. And within that record, I contain the, um, the EML file, which records the, the actual message and any attachments are also part of that record. So they're already associated within the digital preservation system um, and they're separately identified as individual files. And so because I'm going to need to work with these emails, I need some way to actually display them and read them so I can make them available. I can provide access to these emails. Um, and what we'll see is that we've preserved some of the um, the formatting, so embedded images are coming through, um, markup that puts uh, email signatures into nice fonts is all being preserved. And the links between these documents um, have been recorded and I can read my original um, attachments in much the same way as I would have read them um, within the system. So being able to um, analyze the variety of complex packages, being able to determine the original structure, I'm able to also determine where messages have attachments, where these complex relationships exist between files, um, but also make these files individually identifiable so that future preservation actions will be able to work on those files in just the same way that we've um, seen them work on um, other files that have been ingested that weren't originally part of um, an email trail. Um, and where relationships between um, messages need to be uh, preserved so we know that 
emails are often conversational threads, we can record those as well. So we can start to manage uh, the complexity of um, emails in order to ensure that as we take care of them in the long term, as we plan for their migration to other forms, we know what all of the key relationships, what all of the um, key information that we're actually trying to preserve is. And that's the, the first step in making sure that we have um, a good long-term strategy to protect this content. So I just want to quickly recap what we've covered overall in these two sessions. So in the first module, um, we were looking at the, the need for digital preservation and the real fundamentals of um, preserving digital content. We talked about the um, main ISO standards um, that apply in this field. We also talked about the metadata that you're going to require to enable long-term preservation planning, um, particularly the, the bits of metadata that would be specific to digital content, such as fixity and technical characterization. And today what we've been looking at is digital preservation planning and the actions that we're going to perform as part of um, our digital preservation life cycle. But we've also been looking at how that fits in the, the wider information life cycle. So migrating from legacy systems, dealing with uh, content from things like email systems, how we manage um, life cycles on these digital records, whether they be non-permanent or permanent records that require changes in some format. We've also looked at how digital preservation systems can start handling complex formats by analyzing the relationships between different files and different records. And so hopefully we've also covered um, most of these, if not all of these points in terms of what's really important when it comes to looking after digital records. So as I say, authenticity and provenance, we were mainly looking at as part of the first module, but that long-term preservation, retention, disposition, um, and how that fits into the wider landscape of access and security policies um, is what we've been focusing on today. Um, so I'm going to see if there are any questions and hand back over to Michael. Well, thank you, Jack. Um, fantastic um, overview of um, some of the challenges of how digital preservation fits into the, the overall information lifecycle and particularly you know, how we can handle uh, more complex uh, file formats. And uh, so we're going to open the floor for, for questions. So you can use the uh, the Q and A or the chat box to to enter your questions. If you want to uh, ask any questions at this stage, all is quiet. <laughs> So there's one on the Q&A, Michael, um, a question on how you'd handle compressed PDF files. Um, so compression in files in general is one of the risk factors that you might consider for the long-term preservation of that information, because typically that compression has used some algorithm that we are going to need to rely on to be able to decompress it and extract that information um, at a later point. So that would probably build into your decision about what's at risk um, and whether you might want to consider normalizing um, these compressed PDF files uh, to maybe uncompressed PDFs or um, a more plain text format like PDFA. Um, which would give you a, a lower risk for your long-term 
preservation um, and ensure that you're using tools that are still around and available to um, extract and render that information to make sure that you've got a copy that you are confident can be can be handled in the long term. Okay, thank you, Jack. Any more questions? Okay, uh, so it looks like uh, you can always send your questions in anyway to uh, info at preservica.com. We can, uh, Jack can uh, to look to handle them then. Uh, just a few quick next steps. Reminder that the next hot topic webinar is on the 8th of December. Uh, there's also plenty of information on digital preservation up on uh, preservica.com on the resources area, uh, including the, the two papers you can see there. And then as a final reminder, uh, the objectives today were to look at digital preservation within the information governance lifecycle and also um, looking at how we handle long-term records and emails in particular, uh, as well as how we can provide greater transparency through controlled access to information uh, to you know, either to internal audiences or, or to public users. So at the beginning, we value your feedback and uh, we'd so when you exit the uh, the webinar today, you, you'll be presented with a uh, evaluation form, and we'd love to get your feedback. And as I said, everyone who provides feedback will also get a copy of the slides. So take care. I hope you've uh, enjoyed module one and module two. Thanks for for uh, staying with us, and I hope you can take a lot away from this to help you uh, in in your jobs and uh, and your role. Take care. Bye bye.